Now, the greatest event in history was the coming of Jesus Christ, no doubt, into the world uh, to live and to die for all of mankind. That is the number one thing that changed the world. 2,000 years ago, Jesus' appearance on the earth changed everything and uh, changed calendars. It changed history. It changed everything because of that day. And uh, the next greatest event, uh, which was connected to the greatest second, but there's another event that took place, and it is the going forth of this church that was birthed on Pentecost Sunday. The church that was birthed on Pentecost Sunday, the embodied uh, life of Christ and the uh, to spread the knowledge uh, of his salvation throughout the world, to be a witness for him throughout the world, that was just the greatest next peace that came to, to bear. And it was not an easy task, for, for the church because uh, the, the, they, the church was faced with this real issue. She came down from the upper room, which was the day of Pentecost, 120 filled the Holy Ghost. There was 500 in the room, 380 left. They couldn't wait. That's the way it is in church today. Many times people leave and they leave early and they miss the best part. And many times people are in church for two or three years and they get weary and doing well, so they quit, they leave. And they miss what God's doing. And uh, I, didn't, I wouldn't want to be the 380 that walked away. I want to be the 120 that was there when this thing happened. And, and so to carry on the work of a man who was known to have died, you got to get a picture now. Here we are in Jerusalem, and we have this outpouring of God, and this group of 120 are given a task to communicate to a populace of all kinds of people, uh, Jew, Gentile, and in between, and they're there and they're stuck with this whole concept of a man who was known to have died. He died as a criminal dies. And more than that, they were given the task to persuade others that this man had risen from the dead and was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. Amen. What a task. Now, you know, that had to be an incredible moment to have this experience and try to figure out how are we going to tell people the guy that was hung in between two uh, criminals and died a, a, a criminal, died a man that, that uh, they exchanged a Barabbas for him who was a criminal. I mean, how is it possible that we're going to leave this upper room and go tell the world the Messiah is that person? Well, he died. How, I mean, how can you deal with that? This was a very difficult challenge. The whole thing was doomed to, to failure from the start, from the carnal mind. Thomas was probably having a real hard time. Thomas the doubter. Who would give credit to such a wild story, he might have said. Who would put the faith, their faith in one whom society had condemned and crucified along with common sinners and thieves and criminals? Uh, left to herself, the church was in a mess with no way to pass this on for 2,000 years, yet we know that something transferred and something happened that here we are 2,000 years later and the story is just as rich today to you and I as it was to the 12, 120 in the upper room. So how, how, can I, how can I so communicate a product that if I was selling a product that people will want to buy it for 2,000 years? The new church did not perish. It's a real miracle, saints. That the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that was birthed that day did not perish. The next great event that affected mankind, which connects to that and is still having effect, is what Jesus promised that would come in John 14, 16, and 17. But you know and recognize him, for he lives with you constantly, and he will be in you. Put it on the board. John 14, 16, 70. Jesus told them about the promise that was coming, but I love the fact the last part of that, verse 17 says, he says, I want you to know he's with you. How many of you know Samson knew the Holy Spirit was with him? Noah knew the Holy Spirit was with him. But Jesus added a piece. He said, he's not only going to be with you, he's going to be in you. How many of you know the in you is what changed everything? Because now the Holy Spirit was not just there to accompany a setting of events. Now the events were going to be orchestrated and ignited through the people that he was going to possess. 
People are worried about demon possess, possession. You know, and Christians especially, they get all locked up and worried about demon. I'm, I'm thank God I'm possessed. Amen. Amen. I was demon possessed, but I got possessed. And one greater came into this temple and said to the one that was in this temple who had run this temple for all those years, excuse me, but you got to leave. I'm the new caretaker. I'm the new comforter. And I've come to sit down inside of the vessel that I have been given because the blood was shed and purchased so I could come and live inside of that vessel. And I'm now taking up residence in that vessel. And that vessel and I are going to walk together and fulfill the will of God. So Lucifer had to step out and no longer could control. Paul even talks about it. That you were ruled and run, run by another spirit before you got saved. But now you got the spirit of God. Hallelujah. If you're born again. Now, so, so get this story now. So the church began, this whole church story, uh, which repeated Acts uh, 1, 7, 8. So the Holy Spirit, which has come upon those in the upper room, came to empower the church. And I want you to get this today because I'm about to say something that's going to rock your boat. But God wants power in his church. Amen. That dudamus is not a byproduct I'm going to read something to you in a minute, but I'm going to tell you to it in my own words. When I begin to read that scripture of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, coming in verse 1 through 3, I want you to look at verse 2 over and over and over in various translations. I read it last night in 31 different translations. And when I read those translations, I was shocked. It had me standing up in my office. Ain't nobody in there but me, and I'm standing up like I'm at attention. Because it says that when the Holy Spirit came, he ripped open the heavens. Come on, saints. Now, look, that ain't no little gliding, smooth little, you know. I, 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 I don't like people that talk to the, uh, to the church about the Holy Spirit being a perfect gentleman. That is incorrect. He is not a perfect gentleman. He's a disruptor. He's the one that they said about Philip. These men that are turning cities upside down have now come into our city. This is another thing. This is not some little sweet kumbaya. It split heaven wide open and came down. That's a wind that Paul likens it to the wind that destroyed his boat on that day on that ship going to Rome. It is a, 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 a storm came in. I don't mean a little poof. A little powder puff, poof. You'll see why I'm telling you this. This was a wind. It was so violent, it ripped. It ripped the atmosphere open because it came with power. It came with power. It did not come to make you feel good. It did not come to make you like everything. It came to disrupt, uh, it came to reorganize, it came to do everything that you didn't want to do. It came to renew your thinking, it came to change your attitude, it came to change your altitude. It came and changed everything. Hmm. So the church began in power. She moved in power. And she moved in power just as long as she had power. But when she no longer had power, she dug in for safety and she sought to conserve all the gains that she made. You see, the church of the revival years gone by has been turned over to administrators instead of those that are seeking God and are hungry for a fresh move of God. The assemblies of God and these great churches, the Wesleyan movement that happened through the Wesley brothers and the, uh, the church, the Wesleyan church, a Methodist church was established. Uh, and one of them lived right here on this property in 1743 and held prayer meetings right here. We found money, Irish half pennies in a bag dated back to 1742. And that man was here. We have it from the history books. We have it from the museum down in Baltimore, the Robert Strawbridge Museum. We have it from the history of in Annapolis that, that Robert Strawbridge lived in a tenant house right here on this property. He held prayer meetings here. All we did is come 200 years later 
and uncover the mantle that was left here. When you die, you don't take your mantles, you leave your mantle. We found a mantle laying here, and it was a mantle of prayer. It was a mantle of anointing, and we just picked it up and began to wave it around, just like Elisha did uh, uh, with Elisha's mantle. We saw the fruit of that God had been here, and where God's been, he'll come again. Where God's been, he'll come again, because God's attracted to his own presence. The church got to have power. But when she advocated that power and gave up that power, she turned into denominationalisms. She turned into religious structures. And religion takes more people to hell than the devil ever tried. But her blessings were like the manna of Moses' day. When they tried to keep it overnight, it bred worms and it stank. So it was replaced with a lot of isms, of socialism, institutionalism, denominationalisms, and all reflecting the same thing, the absence of spiritual power. Hmm. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is likened to wine and not water. Water refreshes, but wine influences. Come on. The Holy Spirit, some have likened it to water. It's not like water. The Word's like water. The Holy Spirit's like wine. And I mean the best kind. It kind of makes you drunk. Because they accused Peter of being drunk. It was the ninth hour and they said, this guy's got to be drunk to be that happy. How do you know one of the things that the Holy Ghost will give you is joy? Sometimes I wish so much that God's people would get happy. I've told people before, you know, that I, one day I'm just going to get a bunch of mannequins and put them in here. And I'm going to paint happy faces on all the mannequins. And, and I'll, I'll do my best with their hair. And I, I'm going to get them to at least smile. Come on. Sometimes Christians are the saddest people in the world. You get the Holy Ghost, you ought to be happy. You ought to be full of God. You ought to be rejoicing. I was coming in today going, thank you, Jesus. I'm alive and on my way to church. Because, saints, there was a day I won't go in there. But I thank God every day of my life I get up and I get to look at the heavens and I get to sound out, yay, I'm still alive. And I smile and say, my God, you're a good God. Come on. Baptism of fire is not a refreshing, it's an igniter. A power that's released with energy and zeal. Look at this. It says that that storm that broke in on them. I'll read it to you. Acts chapter 2. Go there. Put verse 3 up. Uh, verse 2 up. The storm that came in ripped heaven open and fire dropped down. I'm going to tell you something now. Fire is one of the elements of the world, of the whole earth existence. And fire has energy. Come on. Fire is what runs your car. It ignites the piston uh, from the fire of the gas and the spark, and it runs your car. How do you know? You and I need fire in us. We need Holy Ghost fire. You know that John the Baptist said uh, to the disciples that Jesus was coming, and when he came, uh, he was going to baptize you with fire. Hello. I see people say, Spirit filled. Yeah, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm not trying to put it down, but saints, if I came and, and poured a little gas on your backside and lit it, you wouldn't be going, I got a little fire. <laughs> Hello? You got to come with me now because this is going to help you. So, so it's a power, released energy. It moves people, this, this fire, this energy. It moves people, places, cities, nations toward God encounters. A life-changing event that leads to a life-changing life. Acts 1-2. And there appeared it, uh, to them tongues resembling fire, which settled on each one of them. Now Matthew 3, go there, 11 and 12. Matthew 3, 11 and 12. Come with me now. I'm right at the best point I want to make with you today. 11, uh, uh, Matthew 3, 11. John declares, I just mentioned it, Jesus would baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 12. With a fire that can't be put out. Why are God's people trying to put out the fire? God didn't call you to be firemen. He called you to be on fire. 
You need to stop coming to church with your hose in the hand so you can water down what God's trying to do. Stop trying to water down an experience. We go, well, I, 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 I don't know if I, if I can handle this Pentecostal thing because, I mean, sometimes they lay on the floor and sometimes they, they roll around and they speak with these funny languages and all. Put your fire hose down a minute and let God light a fire in you and when you get on the floor rolling around, you won't even see anybody else. You won't care about anybody else. Some of you sit with your jaundiced eyelids and you look at things and you say, well, let me see. Who made you a critic? God didn't make you a fireman. He didn't make you a critic. He made you somebody supposed to contain a, a fire that can change other people's lives. These signs shall follow them that believe. There ought to be something in your life. Now look at this. So Paul, uh, uh, John the Baptist says you're going to get the Holy Ghost and get the fire. Now let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 8. Stay with me. You're going you're to get some. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 and 12. Put it on the board, please. Put it on the board, please. Yeah. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6. At the end of another 40 days, Noah opened a window of the ark which he had made. So Noah's there, he opens the window, he lets out a raven, raven comes back, he opens the window. Watch this now, watch this. And he sent for the raven and he kept going to and fro until the waters were dried up from the land. Go on, and he sent, uh, uh, then he sent forth a dove to see if the waters had decreased from the surface of the ground. And the dove found no resting place on which to roost and she returned to him uh, to the ark, for the waters were yet on the face of the whole land. So he put forth his hand and drew her um, to him uh, into the ark again. Okay, keep going. And he waited another seven days. Notice the seven days. And again sent forth the dove out of the ark. Okay, there she goes again. And the dove came back to him in the evening again. And behold, in her mouth was a newly sprouted, freshly plucked olive anointed leaf. Amen. And so Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the land. Keep going. And he waited another seven days and he sent forth the dove, but she did not return to him again. I wonder something. You know, you, you hear this story, the heavens got opened. I, I, I'm sorry, the ark got opened. Uh, heavens got opened. Uh, and, and then I start looking at this thing. I said, look at Mark 1.10. Mark 1.10. Now this dove is flying around. Are you hearing me? And all of a sudden it says, and when he, Jesus, came up out of the water at once, he saw, John, saw the heavens tore open and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, coming down to enter into him. You mean to tell me that the dove that was released because God was about to reestablish blessing over the earth and not curse the earth again and death was not coming back, the dove of God had been flying around until finally it came back down on the one that was establishing covenant with mankind that God's promise would never again destroy the earth. God said, I let the dove fly till it came upon Jesus. Jesus. But oh, I'm here to tell you something even greater. That dove was waiting to land, no doubt. Hallelujah. And, and he said, Jesus said, and the father said to the son, he was well pleased with him. So the dove came on Jesus to fulfill God's promise. Acts 2 tells us God didn't send a dove this time. On man, he sent fire. We got Christians that got the stories all mixed up and they go around talking about the Holy Ghost being like a dove and they got the Holy Spirit dove anointing. And I'm sorry, but the 120 that were in the upper room, they did not get the dove spirit. They got the fire spirit. Are you hearing me today? They got lit up. They got ignited. They got fire inside of them. The dove did not land on the 120. And it only landed on Jesus to confirm the promise that God would no longer destroy the earth. We need power today. We need authority today. We need a demonstration that God will give us through the Holy Spirit. He leads you into all truth. 
And how do you know that if he said that they got fire and they spoke in other tongues, you don't have to speak in other tongues to go to heaven. I don't believe. But I want to tell you something. If God tells me that I can have something, why in the world would I not want it? I'm living on the earth. I don't know where you live. But it ain't easy here. And how do you know there's principalities and powers of wickedness in high places that are coming up against me all the time and they're trying to buffet me from running after God? I need some power. I need to be able to say to the demonic world, hold on a minute, you get back. You have no right to my children. Hello? And let me tell you something. When the enemy comes in, many times in the believer's life, it's like the illustration I said on Thursday night. They get the house cleaned up, and they put some furniture in it, but they, they don't get it all refixed like they should, and the condition of the house becomes worse. How does it get worse? You have to keep that presence of fire going on all the time. Israel had to keep the fire burning every single day and night. And God's people have got it down, go to church, get the fire, and then turn the burner off to conserve gas. 